Lightning Thief, Chapter 10, Part 2. You have four questions today. Why does Annabeth say she and Percy can't get along? What is the real reason Percy has taken this quest? How does Percy distract the Furies? Why do they have to run away? Argus drove us out of the countryside and into western Long Island. It felt weird to be on a highway again. Annabeth and Grover sitting next to me as if we were normal carpoolers. After two weeks at Half Blood Hill, the real world seemed like a fantasy. I found myself staring at every McDonald's, every kid in the back of his parents' car, every billboard and shopping mall. So far, so good, I told Annabeth. Ten miles and not a single monster. She gave me an irritated look. Bad luck to talk that way, seaweed brain. Remind me again, why do you hate me so much? I don't hate you. Could have fooled me. She folded her cap of invisibility. Look, we're just not supposed to get along, okay? Our parents are rivals. Why? She sighed. How many reasons do you want? One time my mom caught Poseidon with his girlfriend in Athena's temple, which is hugely disrespectful. Another time, Athena and Poseidon competed to be the patron god for the city of Athens. Your dad created some stupid saltwater spring for his gift. My mom created the olive tree. The people saw that her gift was better, so they named the city after her. They must really like olives. Oh, forget it. Now, if she'd invented pizza, that I could understand. I said forget it. In the front seat, Argus smiled. He didn't say anything, but one blue eye on the back of his neck winked at me. Traffic slowed us down in Queens. By the time we got into Manhattan, it was sunset and starting to rain. Argus dropped us at the Greyhound station on the Upper East Side, not far from my mom and Gabe's apartment. Taped to a mailbox was a soggy flyer with my picture on it. Have you seen this boy? I ripped it down before Annabeth and Grover could notice. Argus unloaded our bags, made sure we got our bus tickets, then drove away, the eye on the back of his hand opening to watch as he pulled out of the parking lot. I thought about how close I was to my old apartment. On a normal day, my mom would be home from the candy store by now. Smelly Gabe was probably up there right now, playing poker and not even missing her. Grover shouldered his backpack. He gazed down the street in the direction I was looking. You wanna know why she married him, Percy? I stared at him. Were you reading my mind or something? Just your emotions, he shrugged. Guess I forgot to tell you, satyrs can do that. You were thinking about your mom and your stepdad, right? I nodded, wondering what else Grover might have forgotten to tell me. Your mom married Gabe for you, Grover told me. You call him smelly, but you've got no idea. The guy has this aura. Ugh, I can smell him from here. <clears throat> I can smell traces of him on you, and you haven't been near him for a week. Thanks, I said. Where's the nearest shower? You should be grateful, Percy. Your stepfather smells so repulsively human, he could mask the presence of any demigod. As soon as I took a whiff inside his Camaro, I knew Gabe has been covering your scent for years. If you hadn't lived with him every summer, you probably would have been found by monsters a long time ago. Your mom stayed with him to protect you. She was a smart lady. She must have loved you a lot to put up with that guy, if that makes you feel any better. It didn't, but I forced myself not to show it. I'll see her again, I thought. She's not gone. I wondered if Grover could still read my emotions mixed up as they were. I was glad he and Annabeth were with me, but I felt guilty that I hadn't been straight with them. I hadn't told them the real reason I said yes to this crazy quest. The truth was, I didn't care about retrieving Zeus's lightning bolt or saving the world or even helping my father out of trouble. The more I thought about it, I resented Poseidon for never visiting me, never helping my mom, never even sending a lousy child support check. He'd only claimed me because he needed a job done. All I cared about was my mom. Hades had taken her unfairly, 
and Hades was going to give her back. You will be betrayed by one who calls you a friend, the oracle whispered in my mind. You will fail to save what matters most in the end. Shut up, I told it. The rain kept coming down. We got restless waiting for the bus and decided to play some hacky sack with one of Grover's apples. Annabeth was unbelievable. She could bounce the apple off her knee, her elbow, her shoulder, whatever. I wasn't too bad myself. The game ended when I tossed the apple toward Grover and it got too close to his mouth. In one mega goat bite, our hacky sack disappeared, core, stem, and all. Grover blushed. He tried to apologize, but Annabeth and I were too busy cracking up. Finally, the bus came. As we stood in line aboard, Grover started looking around, sniffing the air like he smelled his favorite school cafeteria delicacy, enchiladas. What is it? I asked. I don't know, he said tensely. Maybe it's nothing. I could tell it wasn't nothing. I started looking over my shoulder too. I was relieved when we finally got on board and found seats together in the back of the bus. We stowed our backpacks. Annabeth kept slapping her Yankees cap nervously against her thigh. As the last passengers got on, Annabeth clamped her hand onto my knee. Percy! An old lady had just boarded the bus. She wore a crumpled velvet dress, lace gloves, and a shapeless orange knit hat that shadowed her face. And she carried a big paisley purse. When she tilted her head up, her black eyes glittered and my heart skipped a beat. It was Mrs. Dodds, older, more withered, but definitely the same evil face. I scrunched down in my seat. Behind her came two more old ladies, one in a green hat, one in a purple hat. Otherwise, they looked exactly like Mrs. Dodds. Same gnarled hands, paisley handbags, wrinkled velvet dresses, triplet demon grandmothers. They sat in the front row right behind the driver. The two on the aisle crossed their legs over the walkway, making an X. It was casual enough, but it sent a clear message. Nobody leaves. The bus pulled out of the station and we headed through the slick streets of Manhattan. She didn't stay dead long, I said, trying to keep my voice from quivering. I thought you said they could be dispelled for a lifetime. I said, if you're lucky, Annabeth said, you're obviously not. All three of them, Grover whimpered. De mortalis. It's okay, Annabeth said, obviously thinking hard. The Furies, the worst three worst monsters from the underworld. No problem, no problem. We'll just slip out the windows. They don't open, Grover moaned. Back exit, she suggested. There wasn't one. Even if there had been, it wouldn't have helped. By, the by, that, by that time, we were on Ninth Avenue, heading for the Lincoln Tunnel. They won't attack us with witnesses around, I said, will they? Mortals don't have good eyes, Annabeth reminded me. Their brains can only process what they see through the mist. But they'll see three old ladies killing us, won't they? She thought about it. Hard to say. We can't count on mortals for help. Maybe an emergency exit in the roof? We hit the Lincoln Tunnel and the bus went dark, except for the running lights down the aisle. It was eerily quiet without the sound of rain. Mrs. Dodds got up. In a flat voice, as if she'd rehearsed it, she announced to the whole bus, I need to use the restroom. So do I, said the second sister. So do I, said the third sister. They all started coming down the aisle. I've got it, Annabeth said. Percy, take my hat. What? You're the one they want. Turn invisible and go up the aisle. Let them pass you. Maybe you can get to the front and get away. But you guys... There's an outside chance they might not notice us, Annabeth said. You're a son of one of the big three. Your smell might be overpowering. I can't just leave you. Don't worry about us, Grover said. Go. My hands trembled. I felt like a coward, but I took the Yankee cap and put it on. When I looked down, my body wasn't there anymore. I started creeping up the aisle. I managed to get up 10 rows, then duck into an empty seat just as the Furies walked past. 
Mrs. Dodd stopped, sniffling, and looked straight at me. My heart was pounding. Apparently she didn't see anything. She and her sisters kept going. I was free. I made it to the front of the bus. We were almost through the Lincoln Tunnel now. I was about to press the emergency stop button when I heard a hideous wailing from the back row. The old ladies were not old ladies anymore. Their faces were still the same. I guess those couldn't get any uglier, but their bodies had shriveled into leathery brown hag bodies with bat's wings and hands and feet like gargoyle claws. Their handbags had turned into fiery whips. The Furies surrounded Grover and Annabeth, lashing their whips, hissing, where is it? Where? The other people on the bus were screaming, cowering in their seats. They saw something, all right. He's not here, Annabeth yelled. He's gone. The Furies raised their whips. Annabeth drew her bronze knife. Grover grabbed a tin can from his snack pack and prepared to throw it. What I did next was so impulsive and dangerous, I should have been named ADHD Poster Child of the Year. The bus driver was distracted, trying to see what was going on in his rearview mirror. Still invisible, I grabbed the wheel from him. And jerked it to the left. Everybody howled as they were thrown to the right, and I heard what I hoped was the sound of three furies smashing against the windows. Hey, the driver yelled, hey, whoa. We wrestled for the wheel. The bus slammed against the side of the tunnel, grinding metal, throwing sparks a mile behind us. We careened out of the Lincoln Tunnel and back into the rainstorm. People and monsters tossed around the bus, cars plowed aside like bowling pins. Somehow, the driver found an exit. We shot off the highway through half a dozen traffic lights and ended up barreling down one of those New Jersey rural roads where you can't believe there's so much nothing right across the river from New York. There were woods to our left, the Hudson River to our right, and the driver seemed to be veering toward the river. Another great idea? I hit the emergency brake. The bus wailed, spun a full circle on the wet asphalt, and crashed into the trees. The emergency lights came on, the door flew open, the bus driver was the first one out, the passengers yelling as they stampeded after him. I stepped into the, dri into the driver's seat and let them pass. The Furies regained their balance. They lashed their whips at Annabeth while she waved her knife and yelled in ancient Greek, telling them to back off. Grover threw tin cans. I looked at the open doorway. I was free to go, but I couldn't leave my friends. I took off the invisible cap. Hey, the Furies turned, baring their yellow fangs at me, and the exit suddenly seemed like an excellent idea. Mrs. Dodd stalked up the aisle, just as she used to do in class, about to deliver my F-minus math test. Every time she flicked her whip, red flames danced along the barbed leather. Her two ugly sisters hopped on top of the seats on either side of her and crawled toward me, like huge, nasty lizards. Perseus Jackson, Mrs. Dodd said, in an accent that was definitely from somewhere farther south than Georgia. You have offended the gods. You shall die. I liked you better as a math teacher, I told her. She growled. Annabeth and Grover moved up behind the Furies, cautiously looking for an opening. I took the ballpoint pen out of my pocket and uncapped it. Riptide elongated into a shimmering double-edged sword. The Furies hesitated. Mrs. Dodds had felt Riptide's blade before. She obviously didn't like seeing it again. Submit now, she hissed, and you will not suffer eternal torment. Nice try, I told her. Percy, look out, Annabeth cried. Mrs. Dodds lashed her whip around my sword hand while the Furies on either side lunged at me. My hand felt like it was wrapped in molten lead, but I managed not to drop Riptide. I struck the fury on the left with its hilt, sending her toppling backward into the seat. I turned and sliced the fury on the right. As soon as the blade connected with her neck, she screamed and exploded into dust. Annabeth got Mrs. Dodds in a wrestler's hold and yanked her backward, while Grover ripped the whip out of her hands. Ow, he yelled, hot, hot. 
The fury-eyed hilt slammed, came at me again, talons ready, when I swung riptide and she broke open like a piñata. Mrs. Dodds is trying to get Annabeth off her back. She kicked, clawed, hissed, and bit, but Annabeth held on while Grover got Mrs. Dodds' legs tied up in her own whip. Finally, they both shoved her backward into the aisle. Mrs. Dodds tried to get up, but she didn't have room to flap her bat wings, so she kept falling down. Zeus will destroy you, she promised. Hades will have your sorrow. Bracas meas vestimini, I yelled. I wasn't sure where the Latin came from. I think it meant eat my pants. Thunder shook the bus. The hair rose on the back of my neck. Get out, Annabeth yelled at me. Now! I didn't need any encouragement. We rushed outside and found the other passengers wandering around in a daze, arguing with the driver, or running around in circles yelling, we're all gonna die! A Hawaiian-shirted tourist with a camera snapped my photograph before I could recap my sword. Our bags, Grover realized. We left our... Boom. The windows of the bus exploded as the passengers ran for cover. Lightning shredded a huge crater in the roof, but an angry wail from inside told me Mrs. Dodds was not yet dead. Run, Annabeth said. She's calling for backup. We have to get out of here. We plunged into the woods as the rain poured down, the bus in flames behind us, and nothing but darkness ahead.